We're in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 13. We will be looking at verse 8 in just a little bit. Uh, but this will be uh, the first of a two-parter on spiritual gifts. Uh, I thought that I would give you a break from my annual tirade on Christmas. Uh, I think I've done it for the past three years. Um, and uh, I've learned that, that uh, for some it never is not going to sink in anyway, and for others they appreciate it and apply it. Uh, but uh, regardless of that, uh, we'll give you a little bit of a break and talk about spiritual gifts. After all, that's what, um, that's what it is. Uh, the exchange of gifts. God giving a gift, the wise men giving a gift, and so therefore the world has taken um, up the banner and gives uh, gifts. But now, we're going to be talking about, first of all, spiritual gifts, as they are mentioned in the scriptures, and then secondly, the gift of salvation. Now, the reason I'm doing this is that this uh, past week, uh, I have gotten an email from uh, someone who has been here before, um, uh, Lori, that lives down in Alabama, and uh, she is desperate for a pastor teacher. Hopefully, Craig Bruce is going to be able to start a Grace Church down there, and uh, she will have one. But she has um, been going thither and yon to certain Bible classes. They had to leave the Grace Church that was there because uh, the man um, simply uh, does not teach the Word of God. It's not that he doesn't know some of it, it's that he just doesn't teach it. They have given over to the programism uh, of the day uh, in Christian circles, and these families left in favor of learning the Scriptures. But uh, as you go out into these various Bible classes, because men divide the Word differently, when it comes to the area of spiritual gifts, there are, there are various views. Uh, some believe that all of the spiritual gifts are functional for today, so you have things like speaking in tongues and so forth. Others believe just a certain few uh, are um, available. And others believe that there are no spiritual gifts but two, and that is the evangelist and the pastor teacher. And then there's another group that believe there are, there are none um, uh, at all, uh, all, you don't have a pastor, you just simply stand up in the congregation and one will speak here and another uh, will speak there and, and so forth. Um, of course, the truth of the matter is this. There are some permanent spiritual gifts, evangelist and pastor teacher. All the others are, that are mentioned in the Bible were real at one time but no longer are given, they do not exist uh, anymore, and they do not function. And so that's what you have to remember, uh, that there are certain gifts that were given at certain times that were even mentioned by the Apostle Paul and for the body of Christ, which have faded away. Now, one of the uh, places uh, that we can go as a proof text is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 talk about spiritual gifts. And uh, especially chapter 14, it zeroes in on the gift of tongues. Now, as grace believers, we would say, well, now, wait, the gift of tongues no longer functions. It's no longer for us today. But for some strange reason, though the gift of tongues is mentioned in a whole list of other spiritual gifts, um, and we say the gift of tongues no longer exists, we can't seem to get it in our mind, that none of these other gifts exist either. They were for a special period of time. And that was for the infancy of the church. Between 29 AD and 79 AD, there was a transition from law to grace, from Christ as king of the Jews to Christ as head of the church from Peter's ministry and that of the 12 apostles to Paul and that of the one apostle, from their writings and message to his writings and message, from their protocol and policies again to his. Now, in between that time, you have to remember that the scriptures that we hold in our hand did not exist uh, from Matthew on to Revelation. This is the time that they were written. So you have the Hebrew uh, uh, epistles written to Jews that will be for a future generation, and you have the epistles that will uh, begin to be written for the uh, age in which we now live, the dispensation of grace. They did not have immediately all these letters that we have and can study. 
Therefore, God, whose policy is never to leave himself without a witness, gave gifts to people in the church uh, to minister to them spiritually. So that is what these temporal spiritual gifts are. And you have to ask yourself, what gifts are temporary? What gifts are permanent during the, dispens uh, during the transition period? But then you have to ask yourself another question. What gifts are temporary and what gifts are permanent uh, after the transition period? And then after the dispensation of grace. Now, that all of the gifts except communication gifts, evangelist and pastor teacher, are removed is found in these verses. Love never fails. In other words, it's always going to be there. But whether there be prophecies, that is the gift of prophecy, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And by the way, the gift of prophecy was a gift where because pastor teachers were not yet trained, uh, there, they had uh, grace churches but no grace pastors, um, somebody would have the gift of prophecy and God the Holy Spirit would give them unction, would move them, give them the words to say, they would stand up and speak to the congregation uh, and it would be uh, in accordance with the Pauline message and the congregation would grow. That's what it is. But now that we have the permanent word of God and the permanent gift of pastor teacher generationally through this age, there is no need for this, for this temporary supernatural uh, uh, bestowed gift uh, as it was during the um, uh, transition period. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be revelatory knowledge, not knowledge uh, itself, uh, but revelatory knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, Paul is speaking during the transition period. Uh, from the time that he's writing this book, Ephesians has not been written. Colossians has not been written. Uh, Philippians has not been written. The, the pastoral epistles have not been written when he wrote this. So when he wrote the Corinthians, did they know fully or did they know in part? Well, the, the answer is obvious. They knew in part. Why? Because the word of God, the canon of scripture, was not complete. And so therefore, these gifts of tongues, knowledge, prophecies, and also the other gifts listed in chapter 12 here of helps and governments and administrations and so forth, all of those things were existent and functioning at that time in the local assemblies where there were grace believers. We prophesy in part, but here it is. When that which is perfect is, is come. Now he's talking about, this is in the neuter gender. He's talking about a completed revelation. He's talking about something that's going to come to enable them to preach and speak and know because it's set or fixed in a book. That which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So all of those, those gifts have given way to another system. And we will discuss that system in just uh, a little bit. Uh, basically, um, uh, I'll just refer to it by saying that the gifts that were given during the uh, transition period most of which were temporary in nature. But they were also unnatural gifts. They were something that the person did not naturally possess in their genetic structure. So that God the Holy Spirit divided to, several, uh, to every man severally as he will. He gave different gifts to different people. And they would function supernaturally in accordance with the gift that they did not have prior to this. It wasn't in their genetic structure. And so God the Holy Spirit would enable them to function in that manner. But it was just a temporary gift and it was unnatural. Unnatural in the sense they weren't trained for it. They didn't have a, a genetic proclivity for it. Uh, it's just something that God the Holy Spirit bestowed. However, in the, the uh, uh, remainder of the dispensation of grace, the only two supernaturally bestowed unnatural gifts are evangelist and pastor teacher. Now, 
When we come to the word gifts here in just a little bit, it is the word uh, charisma or charismata in, in the Greek. But when you come to the gifts of pastor, teacher, and evangelist, it's a different word altogether. It's domata, a second gift. And it is a permanent thing in the dispensation of grace. Now, once the dispensation of grace is over, uh, the pastor teachers are removed and they go on to, to function uh, in uh, their place in the second heaven. So the gift of pastor teacher is permanent only through the dispensation of grace. But it is an unnatural gift. It is not given till the person is saved. And uh, uh, it, it is... Um, it is semi-genetic here. The reason I say that is uh, women do not get the gift of pastor-teacher. So you have to be a man. You have to be saved. You have to be saved in the dispensation of grace. And God supernaturally bestows an unnatural thing to you, this gift called the pastor-teacher. Now, some pastor-teachers would call it a curse uh, uh, because of the struggles of the ministry, uh, especially as this age closes. But, um, but it's really a blessing to be able to study the Word of God, understand it, to illustrate it, and communicate its truths to people who are interested. That's a blessing. Why? Because one of these days, he's going to see his sheep at the Bema getting rewards, and it's going to be worth it all. That is the blessing. Uh, but the rest of us in the body of Christ... The rest of us do not have supernatural gifts uh, bestowed in an unnatural fashion. The way God does it now is that it's changed. He supernaturally energizes natural gifts, just like he does in the body. Why does your eye function the way that it does? Because genetically it was formed as an eye, your ear nose, tongue, whatever. Genetically, that's how it was formed, and that's how the body utilizes it. And so when you are placed in the body of Christ in keeping with your genetic makeup and structure, God the Holy Spirit now takes his word and applies it to your natural gifts, and just like he does um, uh, in the body of Christ. So, um, your human body, therefore, provides an analogy to the body of Christ and your gifts. Now, for example, uh, some people, um, let's just, th this is just for an illustration. Some people can sing, some people cannot sing. God the Holy Spirit does not give you, um, uh, you know, uh, this, this, nat this, um, this unnatural <laughs> gift. If you don't have uh, the ability to sing when you got saved, uh, and you're not going to have it afterwards because God, the Holy Spirit, is not going to give it to you. And uh, believe you me, though you might make a joyful noise to the Lord, it's in the midst of other people doing the very same thing, so it sort of drowns one another out. But to sing solo takes a little different, okay? But the person who can sing solo, that gift was not given to them of the Holy Spirit. That gift is given because genetically, that's how they sound. Their vocal cords and, and intonations and so forth are, are made because of the genetic structure of their throat and the like. But here you have two people in the, in the dispensation of grace, and they're both singing. One can and cannot sing, but only one is filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's somebody who can sing that's not filled. Here's somebody who can't sing that is filled. Which one glorifies the Lord? The one with the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that's the point we're making. Yes, God can use genetic gifts, and he does. However, the main thrust of members of the body of Christ is not the utilization of your gift, but the filling of the Spirit. Once you're filled with the Spirit, whatever you do, in, in, as long as it's uh, legitimate, is going to glorify the Lord. So the main thrust is learning how to sustain Spirit filling. So here we are, verse 11. The infancy of the dispensation of grace. When I was a child, Paul gives the illustration, I spoke as a child. Why? I didn't have an enlarged vocabulary. I could only make some grunts and groans, and I could only uh, say a few words, but I began to grow up and acquire more words. I thought as a child. 
But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see through a glass darkly. In other words, uh, uh, we, we understand that there are things there, but there is like a veil. It's, it's, uh, uh, the glass is, uh, is fogged up. We can't see through it. But then face to face, and that's what we're doing now. We come and open the Bible, and in here is the face of God. And we put our face against his face, and, uh, and it begins, we begin to assume his image. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. From glory to glory, into the same image, by the Spirit of the Lord. But you have to have a permanent mirror, a permanent fixture, and that's the Bible. Uh, but then face to face. Now, Paul says, I know in part, but then, when the canon's completed, shall I know even as also I am known. So, let's come to chapter 12. Now, keep in mind that you have to categorize all of these various things. The time in history that Paul is talking about, transition period or post-transition period, Dispensation of grace or after the rapture, and so forth. During the transition period, there were things called the charismata, verse number one. Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. Yes, Corinthians, there are spiritual gifts because the word of God's not completed. You have some of these. Now here's the interesting thing. Many of the spiritual gifts evidently were existent in the Corinthian church. But what is one, the one thing about the Corinthian church that, that is um, outstanding by way of characteristics? Were they spiritual or were they carnal? Yeah, he said, I could not talk to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. So these type of spiritual gifts were used, God the Holy Spirit would allow them to function apart from their spirituality, evidently. Uh, there were spiritual gifts being seen and manifested in the local assembly there because God the Holy Spirit just <laughs> made them do it. What is the difference? Well, the difference between these spiritual gifts and, the, and your genetic proclivities is that you cannot glorify the Lord after salvation apart from spirit filling. He will not use your talents or natural gifts for him unless you're dependent upon his power source and unless you walk in accordance with the word. There's the difference. These carnal Corinthians standing up and down functioning with spiritual gifts saying, Yahoo, look at me, I'm speaking in tongues. I do this, I do the other. And the Apostle Paul says you're a bunch of babies and you don't realize what's going on. It's a transition. These things are fading away and you're not going to always be able to do this. You're going to have to give way to a system where if you want to glorify the Lord with your gifts, you have to learn the system. And that's the, the filling of the Holy Spirit. So yes, these gifts were in existence. But no, they don't function today. And, and this uh, uh, good friend down in Alabama has uh, sent emails before going to these various classes saying, I don't, I'm looking for my gift. I want to know what my gift is. I just can't seem to find my gift and so forth. And uh, I always write back and say, don't look anymore. Just learn doctrine, fit in the system, function in the system, and that's your gift. And it's as simple as that. But we want to make it harder by, by all of our lives searching for something that is so obscure. What is my gift? And the, the interesting thing about it is that these people know what, knew what their gift was. They'd stand up and function. They'd do it because God the Holy Spirit would motivate them. They didn't have to question it. But if I were to ask you, what is your spiritual gift? Which one have you done lately? Have you spoken in tongues? gift of helps, administration, and so forth. Well, that's nonsense. What God does now is that there are certain people that are inclined this direction genetically. Certain people that are disposed in this manner genetically. That is their interest and so forth. So what do they have to wait for God the Holy Spirit to move them? No. You learn the system and use your talents for the Lord. That's what it is 
today in the age in which we live. But then it was different. Verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, the same spirit, differences of administrations, the same Lord, diversities of operations, but the same God which works all in all. But he's going on to correct something. You see, that's the problem with all of this. There are abuses. God gave us a system, finally, wherein there cannot be abuses. You cannot glorify the Lord with your talents apart from the, from the spiritual system that is in place. It's impossible. And so, therefore, there is no abuse of the system. I mean, you, you might think that you're spiritual and so forth, but unless you actually do what is required, you are not and you're failing, regardless of all the natural things you have. It doesn't count. And God, the Holy Spirit, is not going to zap you with something to enable you to do it. He himself must honor the system that is in place. So let's move on. Therefore, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. What does that mean? It simply means, we're in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 7, that if you're going to have spiritual gifts functioning, then know that they are limited in function basically to the local church and the ministry there. And that everybody is to benefit from the spiritual gift. Even though it might be a monopoly and one person have it, uh, it is to be used that all enjoy the riches that come from it. Now, you know the Corinthians, they were, all, they were always prideful and arrogant and boastful and, and, and selfish and the like. And so, not only in chapter 14 did he have to correct speaking in tongues, but in chapter 12 he has to correct spiritual gifts um, throughout. So he tells what these are. One is given, uh, verse 8, uh, the, by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, uh, faith, uh, healing, working of miracles, verse 10, prophecy, discerning of spirits, uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Now, we, we would come and say, well, now wait one second. All of those things, we watch the 700 Club, we, we hear these people use these phrases, and we would say, they don't, no longer exist. So my question is, why then do we keep on pursuing this so-called spiritual gift? If, they, if our answer to these charismatics are they don't exist anymore, why do we keep looking for them? Well, the answer to that is we should not because they're no longer functional. They're not given. They were supernaturally bestowed in an unnatural manner in an unusual period of history where God was changing from law to grace and neither had a completed canon of Scripture. So God ministered to his churches by means of these gifts. But uh, they, don't, um, they don't work uh, anymore. Verse 11, all these work that one and the self-same spirit dividing uh, to every man severally as he will. Now, we're going to move from, from this point here to what actually is the case in the dispensation of grace. What does the Holy Spirit do in this dispensation after the transition? Well, once the Word of God was completed, he began uh, ever so slowly to remove these gifts in favor of a permanent system. Now, if you hold your place here and turn with me to, uh, to uh, the book of Ephesians, Chapter 4. It is our position that in the dispensation of grace, out of all the gifts that came out of the transition period, only two remain, evangelist and pastor teacher. So, they are supernaturally bestowed. They are unnaturally utilized. What I mean by that is that there is no man who is a pastor teacher who had this ability prior to receiving this gift. He had no natural tendencies to do so. 
You know, uh, they say all you have to have uh, genetically is a gift of gab to be a pastor teacher. And those are the guys that can spin yarns and so forth and, and cry and boo-hoo and raise all kind of money through sad stories and emotional uh, 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 tyranny that, the, that they have. But the true pastor teacher doesn't have any gift prior to this. He got saved and he went, well, duh, there's something else going on here. I know I'm saved, but I, I should be doing something else. So it's supernaturally bestowed in an unnatural fashion. And though it has to do with genetics, it is a semi-genetic gift. Women do not have it. Now, now ladies, please uh, don't get upset because uh, you still have ability, just like the pastor teacher, to earn rewards and live your life for Christ. God has not left you out. So here's where we get that. Verse 8 of Ephesians 4. Well, we can go to verse number 7. And we'll give you a Merry Christmas here. But unto every one of us is given the grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, the measure of the gift of Christ, the gift of Christ here is going to be pastor teachers to the local congregation. I should have come this morning wrapped in Christmas paper and allowed all of you to rip it apart. No, <laughs> bad idea, bad idea. All right, verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, let captivity captive, he gave gifts. Not charismata, but domata. He gave second gifts to men. All right, what are these? Verse 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. Now, even though it's not reflected in the English, the Greek has a different conjunctions used here. So that the first three are separate gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists. But pastor teachers has a, another word that connects them both. It's called the Granville Sharp Rule. And it indicates two sides of the same office. He is a pastor and a teacher in one person. That is the gift. And so here you, uh, here you have it. But even among these four more permanent gifts, two are only functioning today. Now, when, as I say that, you have to understand. Apostles and prophets. There are, there's one apostle in the primary sense, Paul, whose letters we have. Secondary, uh, uh, the secondary sense is people Paul sent out. And prophets are those who had this gift who went out and would preach to the churches or stand up in the churches and, uh, and proclaim the grace message. Um, however, since the apostle has written down the will of God for us in the Bible, his gift is only functioning in the sense that we look at his letters as our authority. That's the extent of it. We follow Paul, but there is no longer an apostle that exists. There's no such thing as apostolic succession, whether under law or under grace, no such thing. Uh, they did fill in as they, the apostles began to um, get killed off, but they didn't lose their seat on the throne. They were not impeached. Okay. The two that exist, the one has to do with communication in the word, uh, as far as the, the written word is concerned. The other two has to do, during this dispensation, with communication from the word. Now, what is the gift of an evangelist? His duty is to proclaim the basic grace message and put people into the body of Christ, increasing it numerically. God has not removed that gift. Though all of us are ambassadors, all of us do not work at this business of being an evangelist full time. There are other things we have to do to earn a living and support people like evangelists. And the, the same thing with the pastor teacher, only his gift is to put the mind of Christ into the members of the body that the evangelist gives him. And that is a, a, an increase spiritually. So the one is the numeric increase, the other is the spiritual increase. Now again, that doesn't mean that we don't have a part and, and uh, aspect in both of these ministries, but as far as doing it full time, we are not. These are to do it full time, at all possible. Uh, and 
How long are they to do it? They are to perfect the saints. That simply means throughout the dispensation of grace, generationally, saints come and go. Pastor teachers come and go. Evangelists come and go. But in every generation, somebody gets saved and gets this gift, and they function accordingly to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry, edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. That includes every single person born throughout the dispensation of grace. Their obligation is to get under a pastor teacher, organize their lives to be there, take notes, learn what he teaches. I know, uh, Merry Christmas again, that I'm, I'm, I'm harping on that, but you learn what he teaches. We're not like those out there in Christendom where they give generalities and say, oh, whoopee ding. You actually learn the terminologies, the vocabulary, the concepts, the illustrations, the definitions. Therefore, doctrine can dovetail. You build, a, you build a repertoire of doctrine uh, in your soul, uh, a building. Uh, so here, till we all come in the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. So that, those are generational bestowals to men in order to spiritually and numerically grow the body of Christ. They are the only two gifts that remain. Now, again, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. What does God do now? God does not supernaturally bestow unnatural gifts today, except for those two. He supernaturally energizes natural gifts. That is what he is doing. Therefore, if you want to use any talents that you have naturally, any, any uh, interests, uh, any abilities that you have uh, naturally, you have to be supernaturally energized. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's how the body functions physically, and that's how the body of Christ functions. All right, verse 12. For the body is one and has many members. All the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. All right, there's the analogy. Human body, body of Christ. Uh, even though there are differences, obviously, what Paul is saying is there are similarities in structure. For by one spirit we're all baptized into the one body, verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. And then it goes on to list feet and eyes and hands and, and, and ears and so forth. Now, why does it do that? Because all of the things that it lists function in accordance with a genetic structure. Your ear cannot see and your eye cannot hear. But the body utilizes both. It energizes both, and, uh, and the eye benefits from what the ear does, and the ear benefits from the, what the eye does, and on and on we can go with the trillions of illustrations of cells and organs in, in the body. But all of that has been reduced from something given by the Spirit unnaturally to someone, oh, I, didn't, I can't do this, Lord, you can do it now, and off they go. To now where, Lord, I can do this, but I cannot do it to glorify you without your enablement. That's the important, that's the key. That, that makes it worth it all. These things here, now Paul calls infancy gifts, cheap gifts things that, that function for a while but were non-permanent. These other things, you can utilize them time and again in your life through the system. So let's, let's move on. Uh, verse number 21. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head uh, to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. In other words, all are important by way of function, but all must function the same way. If another person is going to benefit from your genetic gifts, and if God is going to be truly glorified, it has to be through his system. 
Uh, let's, um, let's go on down then to verse number 27. Now are ye the body of Christ and members in particular. All right, we're about to come to a close, so stay with me. Every single one of us. However, now Paul is going to list something that was a temporary list of gifts. He set some in the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, that of miracles. There are no longer apostles. There are no longer prophets. No, it's not a pastor teacher. It's simply a teacher. Pastor teachers, the, the gift was, was, uh, began to be developed. And we will look at that uh, in the springboard um, that we take in the next hour as we move from this to the gift of salvation. Uh, workers of miracles. When's the last time you performed a miracle? You walked on water lately? Changed water to wine? I'd like to see it. Um, good Chardonnay would be fine right now. Make sure it's cold. Okay, wine cooler, that'd be fine. Fuzzy navel. <laughs> All right. That's a drink, by the way. Gifts of healing, helps, government, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all teachers? The answer to that is no. But now note what he says. Covet earnestly, in other words, desire to function the, with these gifts. But I show you a more excellent way. That's the whole point. He's now making a transition in this book. He's making a, a verbal transition here in the midst of the transition period. Look, all of the things that I mentioned are good and they function now, but there's a more excellent way, a permanent system uh, coming that outshines the temporary. And, and that is that um, uh, God now will use you as you are so that there, there is nothing un unnatural about it. It's everything that, that is right about you, God will use. And those tendencies that outshine others, that, that provide you a career and interests and so forth, God will use these to his glory if you have not the gift supernaturally bestowed, uh -uh, but the gift supernaturally energized. The ones that were bestowed are unnatural gifts. You didn't, uh, the, the people who had them did not have them originally. But the gifts that you now have, these natural tendencies, can be utilized for God through the system. 